Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I kind of wanted to change up the pacing a little bit and just do a more of a longer format conversational type video. And I wanted to kick things off with uh, showing my personal portfolio um, and everything I'm invested in. And I just wanted to be completely open, honest and transparent um, with what I'm talking about on the channel and what I'm personally invested in. So I'm going to kind of go over pretty much everything in my investment portfolio inside and out of retirement accounts and a, a few other kind of personal finance inclusions in there as well. And I wanted to also cover off the main topic of today's video, which is a core and satellite ETF portfolio and how to construct one and how I'm using that uh, in my own personal portfolio. So for those that aren't familiar, uh, this is uh, Perla, the investing platform that I'm currently using. Um, if you haven't seen this before, this is an Australian brokerage uh, for those that aren't aware. Uh, this is what I'm currently using uh, to track my net wealth and also I have all my investments uh, in here as well. So basically how it works is you can assign all of your assets and your liabilities um, in this front page here. This is on the main dashboard. So first of all, we have uh, the, the housing here at the moment. So this obviously makes up the large majority of not just Australians, but anyone's um, net worth really. Uh, it's kind of everyone's largest expense and largest asset that they currently have. So for the purpose of this episode, everything you own is going to be looked at as an asset and everything that you owe is going to be seen as a liability. So essentially, housing is basically everything you own, so the equity in your house minus the home loan, so all the debt that you have against it. So this is quite convenient timing uh, for me personally. So just recently, I technically did and did not pay off my home loan. Um, so I'm using a technique called debt recycling here in Australia. Um, which is probably a completely different episode by itself. Um, but essentially, you add in an asset um, by clicking this button here. So you can manually connect um, your bank account, which automatically syncs your home loans, your investment loans, and your savings accounts. Um, and you can add also uh, manually add in your assets. So I have actually added in my house here, and this has gone up ridiculously high over the last one and a half years, really, in Australia. We've had crazy high house pricings, which just do not seem to want to slow down for any kind of crazy reason. Um, so in my neighborhood, this is kind of what houses are kind of going for um, in this kind of ballpark $900,000 region, which is just stupidly high expensive. Um, I did not pay anywhere near that much when I built my house and these houses are going and they don't have kind of pools or kind of big sheds in the backyard. So that's just a conservative kind of the lower end of the range from, from my neighborhood. And you can see here, and with this kind of little approximation mark is the estimated value based on the info we have put in. So I've manually entered this number here. Um, and this one here is kind of automatically synced to my bank. So this is the last remaining bit of my home loan. So it's only 200 bucks. Um, and the reason it's kind of minus 200 is I actually redrew $500 from my home loan last week. Um, because what actually happened is it took um, some money from my uh, debit card account and put it onto the home loan and it went positive. So I've just redrawn that and invested that last week. So it's basically zero for all intensive purposes. And then I also have my investment loan. Now this is a loan I've taken out against the equity in my house to invest in income producing assets. So basically the ETFs that I have in my portfolio. Um, so this kind of plays into the debt recycling um, kind of aspect of how I'm using uh, my house to kind of technically invest. So for those in the US, this might be called as a HELOC, Home Equity Line of Credit. Um, in Australia, it's called uh, Redraw. So what the ideal plan is for the debt recycling is essentially you take all your non-deductible debt from your home loan um, and you turn that into tax-deductible debt in your investment loan. So all the interest incurred on my investment loan, I can use that as a tax deduction when I'm doing my tax return. However, all the interest incurred against your home loan, um, you cannot do that. Um, in Australia. I know there are cases in the US where you can, but specifically for me here, you cannot. So I'm using that debt recycling strategy here um, in Australia. And then you keep coming down your assets. So this Australian uh, share portfolio here, this is pretty much all of my ETFs um, that I'll go into a bit more detail later on. So I've got pretty much, what's that, one, two, three, four, five sets of ETFs in there at the moment. I've just done some rebalancing to try and tidy this up a little bit. So I've tried to trim it right down and simplify the portfolio and I'll be going into pretty much what my core holdings are and what my satellite holdings are in this portfolio. Now, one thing that I really wanted to talk about is superannuation. Um, now here in Australia, for some weird reason, there's a bit of stigma around superannuation not really being 
thought of as our money, um, even though it's, it is our money we're putting into retirement accounts. Um, so for those international viewers, um, super is basically our retirement account here in Australia. So it's kind of like the Aussie version of the um, 401k or the Roth IRA accounts in the US. Um, it's just a simplified version of that. And by law, we must contribute at the moment, at the time of recording, 10% of our income into our superannuation account. So I kind of wanted to go a bit, do a bit more detail about superannuation and kind of show this is your money, um, this is invested, and you can choose what you want to invest it in. So this is an important part of Australians' uh, pretty much net wealth. So basically, Australians have their house, um, their primary place of residence, and their superannuation as their main two assets in life. So I'll go into a bit more detail of that in a minute. And then in the other category, you can add in some extra assets that you currently own. Um, now, <laughs> you, can, you can talk about whether vehicles and other things in your house are assets or just liabilities. And so I've got my car here. Now, you might be going, how the hell did you come up with this number? So I basically go online on carsales.com.au here in Australia, um, and I look at the lowest um, car for sale at the moment, and this is pretty much um, what it comes up with. So I, I bought this car back in mid-2019 for, it was only $53,000, and the, you, can't, you can't get any now um, with the amount of Ks I've got for less than 60, which is just absurd. The used car market here in Australia and around the world has just gone absolutely insane, and <laughs> It's going, to, it's going to keep going down in value at some point in the future. This is just, I think we're in a bit of a bubble at the moment when it comes to used car sales, but we'll see what happens, such as the current value of what it is today. It'll probably go down in the future. It is a depreciating asset um, and it, it is more of a liability and I'm fully aware of that, but it's in there at the moment. And then house contents. So you might be going, what, what is this? What, what does this um, include? So this is basically everything you own inside your house. So all your fridges, your beds, your lounges, all that sort of stuff. And you might be going, well, how did you come up with this, this number? This is basically what my house contents are insured for. So I have an agreed contract with my insurance provider. Um, so if my house was to burn down tomorrow, hopefully it doesn't, but um, I would get a certain amount of um, money to rebuild my house. Um, and then I would also get a certain sum of money, uh, which is this $38,000 to replace all my furniture, uh, basically all my house contents. So this is purely based on the amount of money I would get back from my insurance provider if my house was to burn down. So that's how I've come up with that value there. And then down the bottom here, we also have um, some company shares that I currently own. Now, the reason why they're not in the main portfolio here is because these are not vested shares. Now, what that means is they basically have a restriction on them. So I can't technically sell them. I don't have access to them. Um, they are in a um, share provider, a share registry, um, but I can't actually access those shares and sell them. Um, the vesting date, which is when I can sell them, is pretty much October 2022. So I do own them. They are in the portfolio. Um, they're just not publicly tradable at the moment. So um, that's pretty much the only individual stock I own at the moment. I'm kind of trying to simplify my investment strategy with ETFs and just purely focusing on those. So when I can sell these, I will just be exiting that position um, completely. And then finally, there's a cash account down the bottom. This is basically um, my debit card or my savings account. So all my money from my job gets paid into here and all my bills get direct debited out of there. So I normally keep a few thousand dollars in this account for bills and also saving up to invest in Perla. And then down the very bottom, we've got uh, Perla Cash. So that's basically just the cash in this um, investment account. As you can see, here's like 62 bucks. There's nothing too, too crazy in there. So that's pretty much... Um, the Perla dashboard page, which kind of goes over your net wealth, so where you can add everything in and to get that kind of statement. Okay, so over on the auto invest feature, we have the overview page, um, which pretty much has your current portfolio um, and then your target portfolio here on the right. And then it kind of splits it out here on the left um, and the right hand side as well. And one of the unique features about Perla is you can actually auto invest your money. So any money that you have in your Perla cash account, um, it can pretty much round up to this investment amount. So I've set it up as 2,000 bucks and then you can invest $2,000 every two weeks on a Thursday and it will invest it in the lowest share allocation. So basically what that'll do, it will look at what your lowest um, current portfolio is versus target where you want it. So if I was to invest my next $2,000, it would go towards VGS because it's the lowest from my target allocation. And this is kind of just like the bar, bar graph kind of view of it down the bottom here where you've got your, your set point, where you want it, and then where you currently are. So VAS is underweight at the moment, VHS is underweight, um, and my target is pretty much trying to bring them back up um, to target. 
And VAS and VGS are pretty much my core holdings and FANG, NDQ and Azure are more my satellite positions at the moment. Okay, I wanted to have a chat about superannuation now. Um, a lot of Aussies don't really see this as their money um, and kind of forget about it until they actually reach their preservation age of 60 years old and then they actually take a bit more of an interest in it. So I'd like to kind of put it forward as more of a thing you should be thinking of now. Um, there are a lot of good tax incentives to put money into superannuation. Um, some people in the FIRE movement kind of don't take this too seriously because it's uh, they can't access the money until they're 60 years of age. Um, so it's kind of excluding their, their financial independence number. However, I'm considering it in as part of my plan um, just because of the, the great tax benefits. And my investments outside of super, it's kind of like the, the bridging plan to get to that preservation age. So if you ever wanted to retire early, your investments outside of super could be used. Um, and then you can access those within super once you hit 60 years of age. And you pretty much get it in a tax-free pension. So there's a lot of benefits of putting money into super. And this is pretty much my superannuation um, balance history here. Um, and you might look at this number on the right-hand side here and go, wow, that's a you know, decent amount of money. It's not a crazy amount. There's people with you know, millions of dollars in their superannuation balance you know, when they reach 60. Um, but I really started out with basically nothing. So I've been working for over a decade now. And back in um, 2014 was when my previous superannuation balance was brought into Aware Super when I started my current job now. Um, so I had, what, two grand back in June 2014. So I had absolutely nothing in this account. Um, now, by law, we have to put money into superannuation. So this is just the, the normal, what was 9.5% of your gross salary going into superannuation. So it's just been plugging along in the background, um, you know, for the last five or so years. And pretty much when I got to 2020 was when I started maxing out my superannuation. So I've been salary sacrificing into super, um, which is probably a topic for, the, for another day. Um, but essentially, I've been really cranking the money into the superannuation in 2020. So I had pretty much, by June 2020, it kind of slowed down because we had the, the March you know, coronavirus crash. So I kind of ducked down about $73,000. And then I've been pushing in a lot of money into superannuation, which is why there's this big jump up here. Um, so that's kind of working in the background. And this kind of forms part of the, the core portfolio um, that I'm kind of looking at. And the, the number you see on the thumbnail is basically a combination of this, um, my investments inside my retirement account, my superannuation, plus the investments outside of super as well. Now, with the superannuation, you can go to your investment allocation. Now, people don't really think what they're actually invested in with inside super. Um, a lot of people don't know you can actually choose what you want to be invested in. Depending on your super provider, um, you'll have a, a variety of options to choose what you want. Um, but for me, I like to keep things very simple, Try to I don't want to overcomplicate things, um, especially superannuation should be very basic um, at the lowest cost possible. So you can see here, this is the pie chart of what I've currently got my superannuation broken up into. And this is pretty much the core of my superannuation portfolio. There's, there's no satellite portfolio here, it's just all core. And you can see I've got Australian equities here at 26% and international equities at 74%. And these are single asset classes. So what these are, these are, these are what I'm choosing to invest my money in. It's not like a pre-built um, option. Um, so these generally have lower fees, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and you can see I've got about 36 grand in Australian equities and 102 in international. So that's essentially the makeup of my superannuation balance at the moment and what forms the core of part of my portfolio. Okay, now going into the fees and cost of superannuation, this is where a lot of people can get tied up and kind of get a bit confused about all these hidden fees and extras. Um, but Aware Super have this page here which pretty much lays out all their costs um, pretty clearly. Um, it pretty much comes down to this table at the bottom here. So this is pretty much the management expense ratio of each of the different options. Now all these ones here, these are pre-built options. Um, we've got high growth growth and then balanced conservative growth, all that sort of stuff. Um, and these are quite expensive. You can see here we've got 1.09%. So when I first had my superannuation and I wasn't paying you know, much attention to it initially when I was a bit younger. I, I kind of put myself in the high growth option. I was paying, you know, quite high fees. And then I took a bit closer of a look at a few years ago and I've gone, wow, these fees are, you know, pretty up there and I want to change out of them. And essentially what I have chosen, I have my Australian equities and my international equities here. And this is pretty much VAS and VGS for those familiar with the Vanguard funds here in Australia. And the Australian expense rate is 0.06 for pretty much VAS and 0.07 for the international, which is the VGS. Now, th these are way cheaper than those two ETFs outside of super. Um, so they're extremely cheap. 
and pretty much why I have invested the bulk of my money in these low cost, basically index funds. And they, they are a lot cheaper than the pre-built options um, that you can see up the top here. So that's how I've got my superannuation up, set up at the moment into the single class options, um, low fees, broad market ETFs that form the core of my portfolio. Okay, onto the main topic of today's video, which is core and satellite ETF portfolio construction. So BlackRock and Vanguard have some pretty good online guides as to how to structure um, an ETF portfolio in the core and satellite approach. Um, but essentially it comes down to what is a core investment and what is a satellite investment. Uh, now BlackRock uh, and other fund providers uh, generally kind of recommend around a 70% weighting to your core investments and the other 30 odd percent in satellite investments. And basically, what is the difference between core and satellite? So the core investments generally uh, try to get the market returns, which is kind of referred to as the beta returns, which is just a low cost index tracking ETF uh, that pretty much gets the market return and market beta, which is essentially just tracking the index. So it then moves on to satellite investments. Now it's trying to achieve alpha returns. Now that's trying to outperform the market. Now what these satellite ETFs try and um, configure of is sector bets. So that could be particularly in tech or finance or commodities, uh, individual holdings, uh, like if you want to buy Tesla, Apple, Nvidia individually, uh, that would form part of the satellite portfolio. And then you can also have single country or regional equity ETF bets. So if you want to buy Korean or Chinese ETFs, uh, that's a kind of a satellite approach there. And then you can also have active funds or alternative ETFs. So you can have uh, ARK Invest ETFs, for example, that's an active ETF. So you have Kathy Wood um, actively picking stocks in her inside her ETF to try and outperform the market and achieve alpha. Now, they pretty much all form the satellite approach. Then inside, which is the core, you have your broad-based index tracking ETFs or fixed income. So this is pretty much your index tracking ETFs and any bonds or cash uh, ETFs. So that pretty much forms the core and satellite approach. Now, Vanguard also have um, a paper here as well, which kind of goes into some of the, the benefits of a core and satellite approach. And it pretty much lays out the differences between active and indexing approaching, and then the core satellite approach here in the middle, which kind of gets the best of both worlds. So on the left-hand side, the active approach, basically it seeks to outperform. So if you're actively trying to pick ETFs or individual stocks, you're wanting to beat the benchmark index. So that's why people take an active approach to try and beat it. This typically does have a higher cost. So when you have... Um, individual active managers, uh, they will charge uh, higher uh, fees for their funds. So that's where the higher cost comes in. And then there's also higher management manager risk. So for example, you could have Kathy Wood running the ARK Invest ETFs, for example. Um, and then if Kathy Wood was to leave ARK, they might have a detrimental effect on the stock picks that go into the ARK ETFs itself. Um, and then if that fund manager makes some bad picks, they might underperform the benchmark. There is some risk um, involved there. And there is some shorter term focus. So some fund managers um, tend to have to explain things to their shareholders of that fund um, every quarter uh, normally. So those individual funds might have to meet short term targets and have some kind of short term plays where they need to kind of show a bit of outperformance against the benchmark index, which can kind of put a bit more stress on the, on the fund manager to show that outperformance. And in doing so, there is a lower potential um, with tax efficiency because you're trying to buy and sell, get in and out of positions to try and outperform, you are incurring uh, tax events every time you, you sell, essentially. Uh, so that's the active approach. Then on the right-hand side here, we have our, our index approach. Now, this is just your plain vanilla index funds or ETFs that just track the market returns. So if you buy an S&P 500 ETF, it's just going to give you pretty much exactly what um, the, the index gives you, minus a tiny um, management expense ratio. Um, and the reason it's so low is because it just buys and sells the companies in that index no matter what. There's no active picks. It just keeps the companies in that at a very low cost. So that's why the costs in the index ETFs are quite low. There's pretty much, it says lower management risk, but it's basically nil management, management, manager risk um, because there's no one actively picking stocks. It just follows the index no matter what. It is long-term focused because it pretty much just tracks the index. There's no quarterly reports to try and meet or outperform the benchmark. It just is the benchmark uh, minus a tiny fee. And there is, this is more tax efficient because you're not continually buying or selling uh, in and out of companies all the time to meet those um, target deadlines for the end of quarter outperformance reports. So that's the index approach. And you might be going, oh, well, what's the core and satellite approach? So 
basically you have your index core, which has market tracking ETFs, and then you kind of have your your satellite approach, which has your active bets. So this is ETFs or individual stocks that you think are going to outperform this index. So that's kind of the core and satellite approach there. Okay, now looking back at my portfolio, the current weighting is very heavy in FANG at the moment. So it's pretty much essentially forming the core of my portfolio just by itself um, outside of super. Uh, however, I want VAS and VGS to pretty much form the core in my target portfolio going forward um, and then a small satellite in NDQ. Now, the core of my portfolio overall, including super, is heavy in VAS and VGS. Um, I'm just going to be holding on to FANG and Asia uh, and just let it ride, um, but my I don't want to be putting any more money into those two ETFs. So essentially, I'm going to be dollar cost averaging into VAS, VGS, and a little bit of NDQ if it falls, if it falls under weight. Now, VAS forms the biggest part of my Aussie shares. So what this ETF does, it's just an index tracking ETF, which just follows the top 300 Australian companies listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. So it's got a relatively low management fee of 0.1% per annum, so it's not too bad on the fees. And this also comes with the benefit of uh, quite a lot of dividends, which are paid out every quarter. And they also come with franking credits, which is a uniquely Australian um, imputation, which helps out with minimising your tax when it comes to tax returns. Now, I also hold VGS as part of my core portfolio. Uh, now, what this does is pretty much tracks the top 1,500 international uh, stocks in developed markets. And it's got a pretty decently low management fee of 0.18% per annum, uh, which is still a bit more expensive than the superannuation fund. Now, my satellite picks pretty much include NDQ, Asia and FANG. Now, what NDQ is, is pretty much just the NASDAQ 100 ETF, which just tracks um, the top big tech companies over in the US. Um, so that's kind of a specific uh, sector bet that I've taken, um, and it's worked out quite well so far. One of the other ETFs is Asia, which is pretty much the BetaShares Asia Technology ETF. Now, this pretty much just tracks uh, 50 large Asian tech companies, um, excluding the Japanese market. So it's pretty much China, Southeast Asia, um, and India. So as the Asian market has been getting absolutely demolished with the, the China crackdown on tech, I've kind of been dollar cost averaging into this ETF over the past few months. Um, so I'm kind of taking a bit of an active bet there, um, expecting it to bounce back. Now, my biggest holding by far is in FANG. Um, I started buying this early 2020 um, when the market started taking a bit of a nosedive. Now, what FANG is, it pretty much trains the, the New York Stock Exchange FANG Plus Index. This is the benchmark here. So essentially what this does, it has 10 companies in it and this ETF is equally weighted. So normally every three months, um, this ETF is rebalanced so that each one of these 10 companies here is reall reallocated back to 10%. So every three months, the top holdings, so you can see here we've got Tesla and NVIDIA have kind of outperformed in recent months. So they've gone above that 10% holding. And you can see Twitter um, and Meta, which used to be Facebook, has underperformed the last few months. So what will happen at the end of December um, the top holdings will be sold down and the bought into the lower holdings here. Now, that's one thing I do not like about this ETF because it's you're, you're triggering um, capital gains tax events every time that happens. So it's not the most tax efficient ETF because um, it's not like a, an index tracking um, ETF that's market cap weighted. It's all equally weighted. Um, and what basically results this, we get massive distributions. So if you come down to the pretty much um, the distributions down the bottom here, we have quite large dividends that come out or distributions. So we had basically nothing the first year, but then we got a massive amount of dividends um, June 2021. And because it's paid out as a dividend, I've got to pay my full income tax rate at that. So it's not like a, a capital gains event where you get a capital gains discount of 50% here in Australia. So I've got to pay full income tax on this. Um, and yeah, it's not very tax efficient. So that's one thing I don't like about this ETF. Now, I'm not going to be buying any more into this. I've kind of built out a pretty big position um, in FANG. Um, the main reason behind it was pretty much uh, Tesla. Um, I wanted a ETF that had Tesla as, as its top holding. Um, and because it's a 10%, I wanted to buy into this ETF. And it's pretty much, it's done pretty well since then. And I'm not going to be buying any more into it. So that pretty much um, goes over my core holdings in VAS and VGS and then my satellite kind of active bets on NDQ, um, Asia and FANG. So it's pretty much heavy tech picking stocks pretty much um, in my satellite portfolio. And that pretty much comes over to how I track my portfolio. So for those that don't know, this is ShareSite. This pretty much tracks all your buyers, sells and your um, portfolio's performance over time. 
And you can also do tax reports, uh, which make it a lot easier when it comes to tax return time. And it just makes it very simple to track your total portfolio. So you can basically see here, you can, you can toggle off the showing the monetary gains. So you can see all the capital gains, dividends, and your return in dollar amounts. And you can toggle that over to percentage gains as well. So you can see down here, it's all in percent now. And you can also go into your individual holdings um, and see all the specific details about that ETF or that individual holding that you have in here as well. So FANG is my largest position. I started buying this in the 15th of April, 2020. So the market had crashed and it pretty much bottomed out at the end of March and I started buying in um, around then. Uh, I did sell some initially to kind of offset a capital loss on some company shares. Um, in hindsight, it wasn't a very good decision, um, but I've managed to hold on to the bulk of the shares since then and it has, it has done pretty well. And ShareSite also shows the benchmark against your active pick. So this is the um, ASX 200, so this is the Australian benchmark in the blue and then in the in the yellow is pretty much the fang that I've, I've purchased and it, it's been outperforming since then it's had a pretty decent return it's been one of the better ETFs on the Australian market to own now down the bottom here you can see there's a lot of dividends being paid out now this is pretty much all from forced um, selling to rebalance the portfolio so the first year we had nothing it was a brand new ETF that only started early 2020 however there's been a massive dividend paid out this year um, which I pretty much reinvested anyway. You can see here, I just did a reinvestment there and I did some more buying after that um, had dropped down. Now, that big drop, you can kind of see it here around the end of June. Um, because it paid out such a, ma a massive distribution, there was a big drop in the in the step, the actual ETF price itself and I kind of just bought, bought here after it dropped down. So that's FANG, my largest portfolio holding at the moment. Now, looking at the other holdings, they're not massive positions at the moment in comparison to FANG. So I've got $107,000 in FANG at the moment, um, 15 in Asia, which is the Asian technology um, companies. And I've got the NASDAQ 100s at 18, VAS and VGS. This is my core holdings, which doesn't look very core at the moment. So you, can, you might make the comment that your satellite portfolio is much larger compared to your core portfolio. And this is kind of the strategy um, that I've been playing out in my head. So my superannuation account is kind of the largest portion of my core holding where I've basically got essentially VAS and VGS in there. So I've got 138K in super in the, pretty much these two ETFs. And then outside of super, I've got them here as well. And the main reason why I'm holding these here is pretty much for the quarterly distributions. Um, so I want to keep building up VAS and VGS as my core holding um, outside of super, um, just to kind of get that dividend income every, every three months to kind of get that cash flow um, coming into the account. Now, I've pretty much maxed out how much FANG I want to buy. That's a pretty large overweight holding at the moment it has continually outperformed the bulk of the rest the bulk of the portfolio so i'm just going to let it run i'm not going to sell that anytime soon um i'm pretty much going to be dollar cost averaging into vas vgs and ndq if there's any you know decent dips i've kind of maxed out where i like to be with the asia etf at the moment it's really the only position i'm down on um, it's not by a huge amount at the moment no oh, it's only like a thousand bucks yeah there you go 831 dollars um total return. I have received a bit of dividends, which kind of cushions the blower there a bit there. So that's how I've got my portfolio set up at the moment um, as the core and satellite holdings. Um, and I think I'll wrap it up there. So if you enjoyed the video, let me know. Um, if you like this format, a bit more casual, long form uh, kind of show, let me know and I'll see you in the next one.